Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to Grace Life. Would you help me welcome all of our first-time guests, both here in the room as well as those of you online? Man, so good to be worshiping with you. Well, hey, we're going to go ahead and jump right in because we're in a series called When Life Hurts. And the reason for uh, talking about something like this is because, well, it does, doesn't it? Life hurts at times. And when life hurts, we find ourselves asking questions that often we don't have good answers to. Like, where are you, God? Do you even care? Do you even see what's going on? Are you even good? And so the whole point behind this series, the reason I think this series is so important is because we've got to learn to see what God is doing and how God is good even when life hurts or we're likely to lose our way. So we started the series last week with part one. We talked about trials because life is filled with trials. And I'm not going to give you the answer to what we talked about or try to sum it all up into one sentence or a punchline. I, I think that to, to really get the answer and to understand what's going on in our lives, you need to hear the full message. So it's online or it's on our app if you need to go back and hear that. But basically, we answered the question, why doesn't God just prevent the trials? I mean, a good God would do that. If a good God loves his children, why doesn't he just make life easier and prevent the trials? So again, that's part one. It's online. Today, we're going to look at a universal truth that plays into all of life. It's something we all know, we'd all agree to in most any other situation, and that is that pain is meant to be a deterrent to wrong choices. Everybody knows that, right? I mean, let's start with something as simple as putting your hand on a hot stove when you're a kid. When you put your hand on a hot stove, your body sends a signal to your brain that says, move this hand because you have made a bad choice. And you're going to cause permanent lasting damage to your body if you don't make a new choice. Pain is meant to be a deterrent to our choices, to certain choices, wrong choices especially. You know, if you're a parent in the room, you've ever taken away a device from a kid because you're grounding them. They're making some bad choices. You want them to make better choices. So maybe you take away their phone and maybe you did or did not inflict as much pain on them as they did on you as it seemed like demons came out of them when you took away that phone, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? A couple of y'all got that. The problem is we don't get mad at our choices, we get mad at the pain. So if you've been around Grace Life, you've heard some of my stories, I like to drive fast. I just have things to do, people to see, places to go. I don't have time to sit in traffic. And so I have calmed down, I've gotten slower, I've gotten wiser as I've gotten older because I now have four kids that I would like to give me grandkids someday that are in the car. And so I, I try to drive now to where I'm, I'm only in a hurry. But when I was in high school and college, I was just flat out dangerous. And so I used to get a lot of speeding tickets. And by a lot, I mean, if I got one more, I lost my license a lot. Like that a lot kind of tickets, right? And the whole point of a ticket is the pain to your wallet, the pain to your time in court, the pain to your next insurance bill. Y'all following all that? Some of y'all never got tickets. You don't know what I'm talking about. It's supposed to be a pain that makes you choose differently because if everybody drove like I was driving, then, man, you should have never left home because I was just treating the roads like a video game and like I was just out there, you know, trying to do whatever. The problem is I was always mad at the pain. I was never mad that I had chosen the speed. I was mad that the cop pulled me over. He could have given me a warning ticket. You know cops can choose to give you a warning ticket, so it was his fault. I was mad at him. The insurance company does not have to raise my rates just because they say they want to, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was always mad at everything but the choice I was making. So let me ask you a question. When your life hurts, does the pain get your attention to make you think you should choose something different? Or are you just mad at the pain or whomever you think caused the pain? And that's a really good question. Who's causing the pain? Did it ever occur to you that just maybe, just maybe God is behind the pain because he wants your attention? Actually, this is a story in the Bible, so I'm not making this one up. But there was a time where God's people had gone astray. And in order to get their attention, to draw them back to him, it says that God troubled them with every sort of distress. And I need you to catch that because there is no reading between the lines. There is no gray area. You can't blame the devil. His name isn't God. God troubled them. God inflicted pain, caused them every kind of distress. Now, here's the good news of that story is that it says that the people in their distress turned back to God. The pain got their attention to realize some of their choices needed to change. So what we're talking about today for part two of the series is how God will either use or at least allow pain when we've lost the way. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. That's going to be our main passage in just a moment. 
And while you're turning to that for your main passage, I want to go ahead and share with you some really great news. The news that gets you and me excited, it's the news that we get excited about at Christmas and at Easter more than anything. It's the news that makes us want to raise our hands and sing songs to Jesus. It is the cornerstone, foundational truth of our faith. And again, it's not our main passage, so you went somewhere else, but this is Galatians 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to redeem those who were under the law. That's you and me. So that we might receive adoption as sons. Who's excited for that? And because you are sons and daughters, by the way, this is not speaking just to men, but to mankind. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And Abba is the word for daddy, but it's not just that you know the word, it's that you get to use the word. He is now daddy to you as a child of God. And so you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer going to be condemned for sin and, and punished. But we are now brothers and sisters with Jesus. That's about as good a news as it's going to get for you today. I hope you all know that, right? Come on. Here's the problem. As much as we want to hear that, nobody wants to talk about what comes next for a son or a daughter. And that's where we are in our main passage today. Hebrews 12, verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons and daughters? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Yep, no amens. All weekend, no amens. Nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Yep, nobody's amen in that either. And chastises every son and daughter. Y'all wanted to be included a minute ago. Y'all got to get in on this one too. Every son and daughter whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. And that is what this is really all about. God has one very simple goal, that we would share in his holiness. God is perfectly holy. He wants us to be more like him. And so anytime that we don't look like God, he is going to do what he needs to do to correct, to bring some change in our lives so that we may share in his holiness. That's the very simple goal, everything laid out right there. But before we go any further down that thought, we need to back up to one verse I just read that I know a lot of you objected to inside. You was like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, I'm not agreeing to that verse. And it was the one that said, besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Some of us had very negative experiences being disciplined and corrected by our parents. And as a result of that, this is one of the biggest problems we've had with God. Did anyone here, when you were getting disciplined by your parent, ever show the utmost respect for the moment that they are wiser and better than you? Did anyone ever go, oh, Father, I'm so grateful that I have been caught. Now I understand the error of my ways, and it would not have led me to a good place, and I am sincerely grateful that you are going to correct me. Please be harsh so that I can become a great person. Any, anyone? Didn't think so. You see, the problem with being disciplined is if we inwardly know we are wrong, we still don't want to be corrected. So as I have gotten wiser and older in my driving, I don't get speeding tickets anymore. But the very last ticket I got was truly unintentional. Like I didn't even realize I was speeding. I'll tell you the story. I I was on a trip with, it was actually a church conference. I was on a trip and as we got to the airport, they said, go out and pick any car in the aisle. And when I got out to the uh, 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 rental car place, the first thing sitting right there was a jet black Camaro. Come on, anybody with me? Oh, Tiny little, no, yep, Camaro. So we took the Camaro. Here's the problem. I didn't think about the fact that there were three other people with me, four people in a Camaro. By the way, if you've never been in a Camaro, it does have a back seat, but it is made for poodles and hamsters. (laughs) And so when you put two people in the back seat, the people in the front end up with the steering wheel right here. And if you extend your leg even halfway, even at my height, you are going to do 80 miles an hour because that's just what it takes to get your foot. So I was driving on a bridge 
where you're not supposed to speed. And I looked down and found myself going way too fast. But here's the thing. As soon as I looked down and I noticed it, I went, oh my gosh, I got to slow down. And I took my foot off the gas to slow down because I realized what I'd done wrong. But it was too late. There were blue lights in front of me <laughs> on a one-way bridge. I can't even turn around and run the other way. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. He's waiting for me to get beside him. And if you've ever tried to explain to a police officer while you were driving a black Camaro more than 20 miles an hour over the speed limit that you didn't mean to do it and you had just started to slow down because you recognized the error of your ways, that story just doesn't work. As true as it is. And I got the most expensive ticket of my life. And I was so mad because I truly already knew what I did wrong and was trying not to do wrong. The minute that I discovered it, I was slowing down. You see, we don't like to be corrected. If we don't realize we're wrong, we will not want to be corrected. If we do realize we're wrong, we will think we no longer deserve to be corrected. Here's the reality you and I need to face today. That means we will never be happy with the process of correction. Never. Did y'all get all that? We will never be happy with the process of correction. And actually, one of the biggest reasons we struggle with the correction that God brings into our lives is because, well... We probably weren't disciplined or corrected in the right way by our earthly parents. And by the way, that's what parenting is actually all about. It is taking a human child and training them to become a child of God. If, if I could boil parenting down to one sentence, it is that you have been given a human child and your job is to turn them into a child of God. Now, before I go any further, I'm just going to go ahead and say, if you're a parent here today, I'm going to keep talking about what God is doing in life, but you're about to get a free parenting seminar. And if you're a child here today, you're about to get a free seminar on how to be a better child and what your parent is actually supposed to be up to in the process. So most humans, unfortunately, were not well prepared to be a child of God. There are some reasons. For instance, some of us weren't disciplined enough by our parents. Some parents don't like conflict. Some kids are, you know, stay out of the way a little bit, you know, and as long as everybody stayed out of each other's way, everything went fine. As a result of not being disciplined very much, we, we come to think we should always kind of get our way. But God doesn't think you should always get your way. Problem number one. Then, for instance, some of us were not disciplined correctly because our parents are human. And they might have been angry. There might have been frustration on their parts. And so we don't actually believe that discipline and correction can be done in love and motivated by love. Problem number two. Actually, most human parents in our culture today parent with the goal of the child's best life experience. That's what the goal is. And what that means is essentially they want happy children. Well, happiness over time becomes an entitlement to me. I deserve to be happy and happy becomes a little G God. And well, that is problem number three. And then many parents, well, they don't confront the heart because it's too much work. You see, the truth is, if you're driving on vacation and the minivan is full and the, you know, the kids are fighting in the back and they, you, they won't stop and you just shout out, don't call your sister that and don't treat your brother that way. And if they calm down, you're happy because you're trying to get to the hotel before somebody kills somebody, right? You know what I'm saying? But what really needed to happen in that moment is to pull the minivan over and to get the two children and say, we need to talk. Because there is something in your heart that caused you to call your sister that. There's something in your heart that caused you to treat your brother that way. Jesus tells us that it is from the overflow of our heart that everything that we say and do happens. There's something in your heart that doesn't look like Jesus, and that's what we need to talk about. But that conversation is so much longer and harder, isn't it? And on top of that, many of us don't want to confront another person's heart because of what we know in our own. Problem number four. And then many parents... They don't teach children to submit their will because that, well, that's a real fight, to be honest. And that's what this is really all about. Young people, the reason that you've been given older people who should be wiser and usually are to set rules for you is because the ultimate goal is to teach you that there is a higher authority that will set rules for you. That's what this is all about. Now, here's the problem. Jesus is the one who said, not my will, but yours be done. And we don't follow his example very well. Did anybody here ever when you were a child go, oh, Father, not my will, but yours be done. What time would you like me to be home Friday night? I will comply five minutes early even. 
Did anyone ever say, oh, mother, it is my will to watch TV and play Netflix or watch Netflix and play on the video games all day long, but, you know, I would be happy to do your will. Is there a dishwasher anywhere uniquely? <laughs> That's funny, but it's usually in much more serious areas that we don't submit our will. Hear me when I tell you this. We all have a will. And if our parents don't teach us to submit it as a child, God will have to teach us to submit it as an adult. And when that is what you're experiencing, life really, really hurts. Problem number five. But now that we understand why we have so many problems with God correcting us, let's move on and finish the passage where it tells us, for the moment, all discipline seems painful. There you go. We're never going to enjoy the process in the moment. It always seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, on the other side, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Did you catch the caveat there? The people who experience the peaceful fruit of righteousness, the people whose lives reflect peace and godliness, are the ones who have been corrected by God and received that correction. Let me turn that sentence the other way then. The people who did not receive God's correction, their life is not marked by peace and righteousness. It's marked by pain. Very simple to see where we are in this. You see, here's how this works. God is going to have to take anything that is in us that doesn't look like him and confront it. Anything that is in our heart, anything that is in our will, anything in our actions, anything in our words that doesn't look like him, he is going to correct. Now, our God is so good. And my experience has always proven true, and, and all of Scripture agrees with this, that God is always merciful and gives you the opportunity to learn the easy way. Always. And some of you would say, well, but Jimmy, some people don't grow up in church going to Bible school and getting these lessons in, in G-Kids or whatever. It's like, but God's lessons of what is morally right it is all around us. You don't have to go to church to even learn some of these the easy way. See, it might have gone for you like this. It might have been Kent when he was a kid, because you know he was he was a troublemaker, right? Might have been Kent when he was in kindergarten, breaking in line to go to the cafeteria, and the, his kindergarten teacher comes to him and says, "Now, Kent, you shouldn't be breaking in line because that's that's making more of yourself than everybody else. It's, it's thinking you're more important, and, and you need to treat other people the way you want to be treated." Now, some of you might have been that amazing kindergartner that goes, "Oh, my teacher, thank you." You have helped me learn a valuable life lesson where I will now succeed in life in ways I never could have before. <laughs> Truth is, most of us probably just waited till the next time the teacher wasn't looking and we broke in line again. You see, if you've been given the easy opportunity to learn and you didn't take it, then God has to bring the correction. It might have been your kindergarten teacher. It might have been your first grade teacher. It might have been a coach somewhere along the way. It might have been the boss at your first job. I believe that God has given all of us the opportunity to learn a lesson the easy way. If there's pain in your life, it means you might have missed the lesson. Because now God will have to do something different to get our attention. And by the way, that actually explains all the pain. You see, God says to forgive because you're forgiven. And if you don't, there will be pain in your heart. It's called bitterness. It's called resentment. And there will be pain in your relationship with the person you're not forgiving and maybe even the end or loss of that relationship. And life will hurt until you do it God's way. God says, Jesus is the one who told us, remove the plank first from your own eye before you try to remove the speck from someone else's eye. And if you don't, there will be pain in your interactions with every person you think is wrong. And that pain will be felt in your marriage, in your workplace, in your friendships, in your family. And life will hurt until you do it God's way. God says to be wise with our spending and save for tomorrow. Be generous to others and honor him by tithing. And if you don't, there will be pain in your finances and life will hurt until you do it God's way. God says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building that person up in that moment. But if you don't, there will be pain in your life because of your words. And that pain will be felt in your marriage, your workplace, your friendships, and your family. And life will hurt until you do it God's way. You're starting to get this, right? 
God says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And if you don't, there will be pain in your body because, well, you didn't steward your body with healthy food and habits. Let's turn that a little more spiritual because God says your body is also the temple of the Holy Spirit. Treat it as holy. But if you don't, there will be pain in your heart because you treated your body as a temple for your pleasure on your terms. And life will hurt until you do it God's way. God says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And if you don't, you'll have pain in all of life because God's ways are better. And that's really the point that it all comes down to. God is not punishing you as much as you think punishment as it is. God saying, I have something better for you, so much better for you. When God revealed himself and his name to his people through Moses, he said, tell the people this. He said, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The curse is the consequence. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Too many of us think that God is being mean, he's being bad, he's taking all the fun out of life. The truth is God's trying to put more fun in life. The pain is meant to turn us to the blessings of God because we've apparently chosen the opposite. Let me give you an illustration that I think will make the most sense and make this as practical as I can. I've got four kids and I live two hours from the beach. And so that means that every summer vacation was vacation at the beach, right? Come on, y'all live here, so you know what I'm talking about, right? And so all of my children have grown up going on vacation to the beach. And so they all had their first trip. Now, if you've ever been a parent and you've taken your kids to the beach, whatever their first trip is, if it's six months old, nine months old, 12 months old, doesn't matter, wherever they are on their first trip to the beach, you take them out there, you put them in the sand, you give them a little shovel like a six-year-old knows what a shovel is. But anyway, we give them one, right? And the first thing they do is they take their other hand, they dig in the sand, get a mouthful of sand, and do what with the parents? Stick it in their mouth. Now, here's the problem. If you don't know, I'm going to help you out, you should know, Chocolate cake is better than sand. I promise. Chocolate cake is way better than sand. Chocolate mousse, better than chocolate cake, twice as better than sand. But anyway, the point is chocolate cake is better than sand. However, have you ever tried to take sand from a nine-month-old as they're stuffing it in their mouth? It's not a pleasant experience. They're not going to be happy about the correction. They might even cry, scream, and throw a fit because they want the sand. You've got chocolate cake, but they don't want the chocolate cake. How dare you take away their fun? And here's the problem. You and I are trying to live our best life ever with a mouthful of sand. And God really does have something better. He's not a mean God in heaven with punishments awaiting and lightning bolts in his hand. He's actually offering you chocolate cake endlessly. He's a God who loves you more than anything. And he's drawing you to his blessings and to his presence. Any pain in our life is meant to turn us away from greater pain and into his blessings. So with that being said, our response today is very, very simple. It's only one point. Sometimes I'll have two or three points. You're taking notes for those of you on the app, and then, you know, they're well-crafted sentences, so hopefully you'll remember them later in the week, and you fill in the blank with the key words and all that sort of stuff. Today's going to be much, much easier because there's only one point. One point is all you have to remember today. I think you'll be able to remember even on Wednesday as you're, as you're talking to somebody. And on top of the fact that it's only one point, it is only one word. I think you're going to get this. But before I tell you what it is, the good news is you're going to absolutely love this. It's going to be the favorite point I have ever preached. You're going to come up to me in the hallway and thank me for telling you this. You are going to put it on a note card. You're going to put it on your refrigerator. It's going to be the favorite word you've ever heard. All right, everybody ready for this? Our one response today is repent. Yeah. That's the best response I've actually gotten out of four services, for the record. <laughs> See, here's the truth. I know nobody wants to hear that. I know this doesn't preach well in our world today, and I know that if I stand up and keep preaching repent every week, I will suddenly be pastoring a very small church. That is the world we live in. Because everybody wants to know that God loves you, and God wants to bless you. And actually, that is what I'm telling you. God does love you, and God does want to bless you. Here's what Peter told people when he preached his first sermon. He told me, he says, repent then and turn to God so that. Don't miss the so that. So that. Your sins may be wiped out. Who wants their sins erased? And the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Who wants refreshing from God? Who wants to experience his presence, your sins far from you? That's exactly it. Repent so that. I've often said it. You've heard it here at Grace Life. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you just as you are. But he loves you too much to leave you just as you 
are. The simple goal is God is making us like him, that we may share in his holiness. And there are some painful things that we go through in life to discover how we can be more like God. Has anybody ever taken one of those Facebook tests to figure out what kind of vegetable you would be? I don't even know why those things exist. But if you've ever wanted to take a test on your holiness, if you've ever wanted to take a test on whether or not you are lazy or selfish or proud or arrogant, the test is called marriage. There we go. Y'all starting to catch on. Come on. Not marriage alone. But it's definitely one of the first things that God will use. We tend to do that at a certain stage in life when we can't wait to get out from under all the people who have been setting rules for 18, 20, 25 years and suddenly want to show our greatness. And uh, and God puts us somebody with somebody who's going to help us discover all of our unholiness. Now, for all of you that just looked at your spouse and nodded, I wasn't talking to them. I was talking to you. Every one of you. You see, I uh, love to to quote a cover of a book. It's a marriage book called Sacred Marriage. And uh, there's a subtitle on the cover that says, What if God meant marriage to make you holy more than happy? What if God actually intended to put you through a process that might be painful so that on the other side of it, you are more like him? I know it's the story for my wife and myself. We... We had one of the worst marriages ever for more than a decade. You've heard a lot of that story. If you've been to Grace Life, you've heard that I drive fast and you've heard our marriage stories and you've heard what God did and the miracle that he did in our lives. But for over 10 years, well over 10 years, I was the arrogant one. I thought anything that was wrong was her fault. She was all of the problems. She needed to make all of the changes. I didn't even know how to utter the phrase. I'd never combined the words, I am sorry, till after I was like 30 something. I don't don't think I'd even known how to say that. It was like painful the first time. But God had to take me through some incredibly painful experiences to begin to face a reality. A reality I would have never called reality. And whatever it is for you, if it's marriage or if it's a job, if it's a certain boss, if it's a school teacher, it's time for you to stop blaming your spouse. Time for you to stop blaming the boss that fired you time for you to stop blaming the parent that doesn't understand you. It's time for you to stop blaming the God that's just mean. It's just time. God is drawing you to better things, much better things, and he wants you to be more like him, that you can experience the blessings, that you can have a life filled with chocolate cake. He's taking away the sand, but it's all for the chocolate cake. Because God is loving. God is merciful. God is good. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but that actually is part of the problem. Let me share this with you out of Romans 2. Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? See, when we start getting corrected by a good and loving God, it's what I call the danger zone. Because God is every part of his nature at the same time. God cannot come to you in judgment without also coming to you in love and mercy. He can't dissect himself. So as God comes to you, sometimes as he brings correction, the mercy and the love is so great, you don't even recognize the pain. And so you don't change. And you didn't take the easy lesson. So God has to bring more correction He increases the pain. Oh, but now it's got your attention. And so you start to get angry at God because we get angry at our pain, not our choices. And we get angry at God, we tend to keep doing that even more. And so then God has to bring correction even more. He turns up the pain even more. And we find ourselves getting even more angry at God. Some of you are living that cycle spinning in your life. Some of you have been doing it for a very, very long time. And life really hurts, doesn't it? Now, since our only response today is repent, I think it'd be very important that you understand how 
to do that, what does that actually mean? Because I practically want you to be able to bring God's blessings into your life and move closer to Him. Many people misunderstand the word repent. They think repent means to just say, I'm sorry. No, that's an apology. So let me share with you the definition, the original word used in the Bible here, the original Greek word, you don't need to know because you won't remember it, you don't speak Greek, but I'm going to show you the definition for it, and I'm going to put it on the screen because it's so important. And repent means that we would change our way of life, to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude in regard to sin. It's three things. Did y'all get that? The first thing is that the way we live actually changes. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't treat people the way you used to treat people. You forgive instead of holding a grudge. You're kind instead of being mean. You change everything. Your choices in life are completely different because of the second thing. How you think about sin, the third thing, has changed. And by the way, that really is something we need to talk about. King David in Psalm said, I confess my iniquity to you, God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sin. I think if there's any struggle that we have in our world today, it is an agreement about what sin is. I preach to crowds every weekend. You are like the emptiest service we have. Look around, like more empty seats than any, and this is still a a great crowd. Crowds filled with people who want to sing songs to God, who say they love God, who would say I'm a Christian and, and excited for knowing Jesus. I mean, so many of you, that's what you would say. I don't think many of you would say, I intentionally just don't want to do what God says. That's, I don't think many of you would say that. So that's not our, our, real, our real struggle in so many cases is that our world today tells us this is no longer the definition. This is no longer a reference point for us. And so the world around us begins to tell us what is right and wrong, and that changes everything. So let me give you one more definition. Again, I'll skip the Greek word. You won't need to know it. But the definition for sin in the Bible literally means an offense against a deity. An offense against a deity. So when you and I start choosing what is offensive, when you and I start deciding what is right and wrong or we agree with the culture around us and pick and choose what we're going to call sin, then you and I are the deity. And we become our own God. Now that's where we have a real problem of pain. Because if you set yourself up as your God on your throne, deciding what offends you as the deity, you better hope there is no other God. You better hope that all the stories about a God that loves you and sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you aren't true. Which is fine, actually, because if you define sin, you can't be punished for it anyway. You chose what you did, and you're in charge. But just in the chance that you do believe in the God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, El Shaddai, well, if you believe in that God, he's the one that said, there's no room on this throne for two. You will have no other gods before me. If you set yourself up as a God, defining sin for you, instead of what he says, you might find yourself in a life of pain. So, I'm going to leave you today with a very simple challenge. When Joshua led God's people into their promised land, he had just taken over from Moses and And he has taken them into the land and they've begun to conquer cities and live in different areas. And the region is large. It's the nation of Israel today and and maybe that space in Palestine as well. And and so he knew they'd be so spread out, he wouldn't be able to see what everyone is doing. He wouldn't be able to police them all and chase them all down. And he would only hear rumors of what was happening in that next city. So before he released them all, here's what he said. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He actually had included in there, choose this day whom you will serve. You can serve either the gods of your fathers, that means the past that got you into trouble, the ways you've always learned in this world. You can choose that. Or you can choose the gods that are around you, meaning the culture, 
So you can either choose what you've already seen people do wrong, or you can choose what the current culture around you is doing wrong, or you can choose to serve the Lord, Yahweh. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I believe this is God's word. I believe it is without error. I believe it is his revelation of himself to mankind. It's the only way I can know him. So I believe I don't get to pick and choose the parts that I want revealed to me. I believe it is his expectation for my life. And I believe this is the definition of sin for me. But hey, everybody, that's just me. Today, the challenge is that you are going to have to decide for yourself. There are many causes of hurt in life you cannot control. But when there is pain in your life because of God's correction, well, that's actually a pain you can stop because how you live is your choice. Now, at this point, I would normally pray a blessing over all you guys, but I'm not going to do that today because I feel the message leads to a different kind of prayer. The other thing that we do every week is I invite people to make Jesus their king, recognizing he died on the cross for them and they can receive forgiveness for their sins. I'm going to do that in just a moment. But today I want to emphasize the two words that we usually sum up with the word king, and it's the two words, Savior and Lord. You see, when we recognize that Jesus died on the cross for us and his bloodshed and his body broken paid for our sins, that makes him our Savior. When we say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I now get to spend eternity with you because I'm forgiven. That's Savior. But then some of us, we struggle with the Lordship part. We struggle with the holiness of God. Well, God, if your word says that, I will do that. I will change to match what you say. To remove the pain from my life. The truth is that there's a lot of pain in your life because there's a lordship issue. Jesus is not Lord of some of your conversations. Jesus is not Lord of some of your attitudes. Jesus is not Lord of a situation that you have found yourself in. The pain in your life when caused by God is a reflection of the lack of lordship in that area. So as we pray today, I'm going to give every one of you an opportunity to pray that based on where your heart is. Some of you may be praying this for the first time, wanting to be saved, to go to heaven, to have eternal life. Some of you may say, I've already done that. I know that's there, but I just now realized there's a lot of pain in my life because I haven't been living God's way. I've been doing it my own way. And if that's where you are, I'm going to invite every one of you to simply pray this prayer wherever your heart is. You talk to God where you are are today. Is that good? Everybody with me? Would you all pray with me and say something like this to yourself and to God? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now I choose to live for you. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. In my simple prayer today, Would you fill me with your spirit and give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom? Amen. Would you all help me celebrate with them, everybody? Amen.